Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Today's edition of Ask an Airstreamer is all about staying connected in your Airstream. Whether you work from the road, want to stay connected to friends and family, or even just watch some Netflix at the end of your day adventuring, by the end of today's session, we hope you know a little bit more about keeping connected wherever you roam. Before introducing our panelists today, I want to take a moment to introduce myself. My name is Chris, and in addition to being an Airstream owner myself, I get to work with Airstream's brand ambassadors, helping to share their stories of adventure, curiosity, and exploration in their Airstream. A few housekeeping items before we get started. Today's session is being recorded and will be published on airstream.com next week, along other editions of Ask an Airstreamer. In other words, don't worry about writing everything down. You'll receive an email to this video later next week. To submit your questions at any point today, go ahead and click the Q&A button at the bottom of this screen. We'll do our best to answer all of them, but if we run out of time, we'll share an email address at the end to submit your questions. After Q&A, we'll share a promo code for Airstream Supply Company, which is part magazine, part travel guide, and part outfitter. And lastly, there's a two question survey that will pop up after we wrap up today. We'd love your feedback so we can learn what you liked and things we could do better in future editions. Let's take a quick look at what we're going to cover. First, we'll introduce our panelists and learn about their experience staying connected in their Airstream. We'll talk a little bit about what the ability to stay connected enables in relationship to adventuring in your Airstream. We'll talk about the different ways to stay connected from Wi-Fi to cellular and satellite. We'll have a discussion on understanding how much bandwidth you actually need. We'll talk about planning for connectivity and then we'll have a dedicated Q&A session at the end. So our panelists on the left, we have Jess and Jake, full-time Airstreamers traveling in their U traveling the US in their flying cloud promoting Jess's awesome business. And then on the right, we have Justin and Ariel, who are part-time digital nomads on a journey to educate would-be full-timers on how to build a successful rolling business. Justin works full-time for a marketing software company. So Justin, Jake, I'll toss it over to you. Welcome and thanks for joining us. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jess. I'm Jake. <laughs> and uh, we are full-time Airstreamers. We have a 2011 Flying Cloud that we absolutely love. And uh, we got started, I caught the bug from my parents who are full timers as well going on about seven years. Um, they also just got park ranger jobs, which is adorable. But uh, I was traveling a lot for work, doing a lot of speaking engagements, was tired of hotels, wanted to see the world and wanted to do it with my family and our 70 pound dog. So we uh, <laughs> fell in love with Airstreams, um, got one and hit the road. What was it, two years ago? About two years ago. Yeah, yeah. and have loved it ever since. Quick question because folks will see your background right now as full-time Airstreamers, just a little bit of context <laughs> about what's going on. Yeah, we um, have our Airstream literally parked right on the other side of this computer uh, and we're temporarily parked in Raleigh at our home that yeah, we're, we're renovating. Yeah, we're renovating our house so we, uh... It's, we sometimes we spend the night in the Airstream because our bedroom is kind of a mess right now. So it's- Our uh, Airstream is more comfortable than our home right definitely. now. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Justin, I'll turn it over to you, now, to you. I know you're flying solo today, welcome. Yeah, uh, happy to be here, thanks for having me. Uh, so my wife, Ariel and I are uh, previous full-time RVers. We have a 2017 Airstream Bambi Sport and we traveled in it uh, full-time 2017 through 2018 covered about 70,000 miles and visited 33 national parks, having a, a remote job for a software company that I worked for called HubSpot. Figured I would uh, uh, take myself out on the road with Ariel and really experience life. Being a remote worker, you have the ability to do that as long as you have a wireless connection, which I feel really fortunate to have. Uh, and while we traveled, we started an outdoor brand that educates and inspires people to live an alternative lifestyle of being a traveling remote worker. And we do this two ways. We inspire people uh, with a documentary that we created, and we educate them with a free step-by-step -step guide that really includes everything that we've learned over the past several years of getting our Airstream and starting to live uh, this lifestyle uh, a lot more. And uh, nowadays, like I said, we're not full-timers anymore. We actually have a one-year-old daughter, which just celebrated her first birthday. We reside in Asheville, North Carolina, and our goal is to be part-time RVers, really traveling up to about 100 days per year. I think that's like a goal that we've, that we've set. Uh, we see being full-time RVers in the future, but right now, 100 days a year gets us out there and still experiencing 
uh, what we love to do. And uh, when we're not traveling, uh, our goal is to start renting out our unit to people who want to experience what it's like to uh, live and work inside of an Airstream. So stay tuned for more of that on Instagram in the future. Awesome. Uh, lots of great experience to draw on uh, for today's discussion. So thank you guys both again for being here. Um, you know, first the question on why stay connected. If you were to kind of turn back, you know, the hands of time, 10 years, and you would look at camping or getting out in your Airstream as a way to disconnect and unplug and kind of take away all the stresses of life. Um, and for a while, that was you know, con conventional thinking um, at Airstream. And so we did some research a few years back, really trying to understand what is, what is the, the opportunity and problem we're trying to solve. And through that research, we found that the biggest pain point um, is really the, the ability to have a reliable and connection to the internet. So we did a survey with some folks and what came from that is the second largest actually frustration with owning and operating a recreational vehicle is, is reliable access to cell data and Wi-Fi. Um, interesting profile, these two charts are from KOA. They do an annual camping study that is a tons of great information in terms of how the landscape is changing in, in camping and RVing. But the chart on the left shows that more and more people are actually working while they're camping. And on the right shows that technology as a, as a broad sense uh, has the ability to allow people to actually tack on a couple extra days to their trip. So you can see this kind of trend, you know, shift over time, but half of the campers who take their work along say the technology allows them to camp more often uh, and enjoy themselves more. Uh, they can, you know, even, even go longer and further. So lots of really good information when it comes to uh, what technology enables. This next uh, stat uh, is probably something that many of us on this webinar are actually living today uh, in terms of the shift that remote work is enabling. So pre-pandemic, roughly 5% of full-time employees with office jobs work primarily from home. And that figure uh, as we get you know, post COVID is likely to settle at about 20 to 30%. So you look at you know, the shifts that have happened in the workplace, uh, the type of travel that an Airstream enables, um, really a great opportunity to, to you know, cross those things together and uh, enable a kind of a more nomadic uh, experience. So there are a couple of different ways to stay connected. The three that we're really going to, to focus on today in terms of what's out there um, are these three. So you have Wi-Fi, cellular, and satellite. Um, you know, Wi-Fi, just to, to do a quick cover of these and we'll kick it over to, to Justin and just to add some more context, usually free. Um, you know, this is the stuff that you'll see at Starbucks, uh, you know, more uh, germane to this discussion, what you'll see it often at campgrounds, um, but it's usually unreliable. Uh, my experience has been, you know, do, doing this and, and connecting to campground Wi-Fi. It might be great one minute and not so great the next. So I usually just try to avoid it altogether. Uh, a lot of that is driven by an older infrastructure. You know, they put in a Wi-Fi network however many years ago, and it's been you know, put, put into set and forget. The next one, which is probably the most common, is using cellular to stay connected. Um, you know, prices vary depending on what plans you can find. Generally, pretty reliable. If you have a signal to begin with, you're, you're usually in pretty good shape. Um, you know, some of the pain points that go with this is unlimited plans with a catch. This is when you get into network management or you know unlimited plans until a certain amount of uh, data is consumed and then you're throttled down. Again, the price can vary. And then on the far right, we have satellite, uh, which is always going to be the most expensive when you look at a cost per gig. Uh, for the most part, you can access it almost anywhere. If you can get a clear view of the sky, um, you can connect uh, to a satellite uh, to connect to the internet. Limited throughput. A lot of work to get that data, lots of miles in the sky and then back down to a ground station. And it's really expensive. Um, I've used this and if I've exper experimented with this on my Airstream and it's, and it's worked well, but it's, it's a lot of effort to get there. So Justin, I'll kick it over to you. I know that you have a lot of uh, recent field experience with this one as well. Yeah, uh, so Wi-Fi and cellular are the primary ways that I access uh, a connection for, for doing work and other things. Uh, while we travel. Wi-Fi, like you said, uh, Chris, it, it's unreliable. Like I never really trusted campground Wi-Fi. So the way that I would think of Wi-Fi is, is finding establishments where you can get, like you can go to them consistently through your travel. So as an example, Planet Fitness, 
uh, was a great one for my wife and I because you, you can work out, you can conserve water as a full-time RVer, which is a pretty big uh, uh, thing to overcome when you're when you're traveling. And uh, they always had strong Wi-Fi and they have like a little working area. Uh, so it was really nice to have places like that. So uh, finding uh, different establishments where you know that you can access Wi-Fi, um, even if it's like a Starbucks, uh, uh, that's a that's one helpful way. But primarily cellular and using a hotspot is is the way that I access uh, a connection. Uh, that's actually how I'm doing this uh, webinar today. I, I'm using the hotspot on my phone. Uh, and that's generally what I do when, I, when I'm uh, having to take uh, Zoom calls for, for work. And, and like you said, Chris, uh, it, there are uh, unlimited plans do have a, a catch. It's not just unlimited data like plans were years ago. That's what we had in 2017. We got on somebody else's grandfathered plan, but they don't really exist anymore. After about 30 gigs of high speed uh, data, it starts to uh, uh, get a little bit slower. But a kind of a caveat to that and what we have is, we have a family plan with Verizon where we can have up to 10 lines. And the more lines you have, the cheaper it gets. So we have another friend who's a full-time RVer right now who has two phones and two hotspots. And the hotspots only cost, or sorry, two MiFi's. And the MiFi's only cost $15 a month. So there are sort of pros and cons to both. But Wi-Fi and cellular have really kept us connected um, and confidently traveled. Awesome. Jake, Jake, Jake and Jess, you guys have uh, some additional experience too. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, as far as the, the Wi-Fi, like Justin was talking about, I mean, we don't, we didn't go to Planet Fitness. We usually just got like, uh, we just worked out on like a picnic table at a campground typically. <laughs> that was did. our Planet Fitness. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, you're right. Campgrounds are unreliable. Most campgrounds, you know, preach that it's there, but you can't depend on it for work. If you want, if you need to look up something on Google Maps or look for a restaurant, it's, it's okay to do that. But you, you definitely can't do a Zoom call with it. It's not it's not reliable enough. It's free, but it's it's not very reliable. So a lot of times, if we had a really important call, we would make sure to search out a Starbucks in, ahead of time. We'd parked outside of McDonald's. Public libraries are really really good, especially now when there's they're not even open, but their Wi-Fi is still on. So you can park right next to the front door and get you know up to 30 megabytes per second. Um, just parked right outside of the library. Now you are working in your car. Um, Pre-pandemic, that wasn't really. Uh, kosher to do, but now it's a little bit more acceptable uh, if you need to get service or, you know, sometimes getting away from, you know, barking dogs or kids running around and things like that. Um, but we just mainly used Airstream Connected. So um, for those of you who don't know, it's a partnership that they have with AT&T that uh, you can just put it, you get a, it's all the Airstreams come pre-wired. I think we're going to talk about that a little bit later, Chris, but um, yep. uh, yeah, but it comes with, you know, you get a router and then you can put a SIM card into there. Um, and it just pulls, basically what it does is going to pull, we're going to have a diagram in a minute, but it pulls down data from the tower, puts in your router, and then it's kind of like your own Wi-Fi hotspot. I um, mean, you can get different plans with that, but that's what we used most of the time. We had an Apple TV that we used um, to stream Netflix or ESPN or what have you, and we could use, use it for Zoom calls or uploading, downloading, working, whatever we needed to do. Um, you know, the big thing about cell towers um, that we didn't notice um, until we got on the road was sometimes they get bottled up, right? So if you have, if you're in an area with a lot of people, you could have five bars. Like for example, we were in Napa, California earlier this fall, you could see the cell phone tower from our campsite, but you maybe got one to two megabytes per second during the middle of the day because thousands, maybe tens of thousands of people were on that one single tower. The, the other side of that, we were in Silverton, Silverton, Colorado this summer, which is phenomenal if anybody uh, has ever put been it on your list definitely put it on our list when people ask us the best place to go that's definitely silverton colorado um but we had like maybe two bars of service and we had up to 50 megabytes per second and like we were sitting in the river in this little creek our feet in the water just working um and it was amazing but you just have to think about that okay how many people are on this tower because a lot of these uh you know you'll call and they'll say oh yeah we have five bars here but you have to consider, okay, how many people are going to be using it at the same time? And that's a little bit, um, you know, a little bit more variable there. Yeah. And we'll talk a little bit later about some ways once you get somewhere to, to test that signal. So if you're really relying on this connection for work, what are the ways that you can remove some of the unknowns? Uh, so you can have a, a stress-free workday. Um, some of the content here. So there's a bunch of uh, approaches and, and gear that you can use to enable connectivity in your Airstream. We're gonna walk through a few diagrams. Uh, the folks at the, the Mobile Internet Resource Center do a tremendous job, at not only kind of tracking uh, different movements in carrier plans and what's available and what is the best value, but they also do a really good job of 
helping illustrate some different methods that you can bring connectivity in the vehicle. So this first one is, is really what uh, you know, Justin talked about. I know he's using his phone in this instance, but uh, is using a mobile hotspot. Um, so here it is you know, in, inside the vehicle, uh, you can get an external antenna, um, but it's creating that, that Wi-Fi network. So the pros to this approach is it's generally pretty affordable to, to start out this way. Um, you know, you can get these these hotspots with a carrier sometimes for free with a longer term contract, or you can you know buy them outright for a couple hundred bucks, um, and they're pretty much plug and play. So no no advanced tech skills required to enable this. You turn it on, Wi-Fi network is there, and you're pretty much good to go. Um, many of them, if you're going to go this route, there's really a big advantage uh, into being able to plug in an external antenna especially in an Airstream, it's a big kind of metal, aluminum, uh, uh, you know, house or vehicle. Uh, so having that, having the ability to plug in an external antenna, one that you could either run to the roof or, or even, uh, you know, affixed to the side of a window is, is really helpful. So look for that if you're shopping around for this approach. Um, so it's a battery powered solution too. So if you want to kind of pick it up and go and, you know, work from the car or, or have a mobile office, away from your Airstream. It's uh, also another benefit of this. And it's easy to upgrade as new options come available, right? You just pop a new SIM card in and, and go. Some of the trade-offs though that go with this solution is if you're not going to use it with an antenna, uh, you might have limited reception. Um, one of the, the benefits of some of the other methods we'll talk about is an external antenna on the roof with a big form factor and that, that will help you, uh, you know, stay connected, especially if you're on the fringes of a, of a cell phone uh, you know, coverage or cell phone tower. Um, this is consumer level, level gear. So if you're looking to do advanced features, this might not be um, the best. And then hotspots tend to be carrier specific. A lot of the research that we've done in this space is that folks who are, who are either working full-time on the road or, you know, learning full-time with their family on the road and it requires them to be connected for some of those classes that folks will have a, a multiple carrier relationship. So they might have a, you know, a Verizon and a T-Mobile hotspot and an AT&T hotspot. So they can just pick different tools um, as they're out there uh, to stay connected. <clears throat> Some of these will have limited data plans, just kind of just depending uh, on what's out there. And, and Justin, you had a, a tip here, just in terms of expectations around an antenna on the roof, right? Just because it's, it's up there, it's not gonna <laughs> magically fix it. Tell us more about that. Yeah, so uh, it, we really had the antenna for insurance, meaning that uh, we wanted to make sure that if we uh, if it helped us be able to get a better connection, it does sometimes. Um, but like Jake said earlier, if, if you're in an area where uh, a cell tower is being accessed by a lot of people, the booster is not really going to it's not really going to help. Uh, so we actually have an antenna uh, a cell phone booster that's installed on our Airstream and on our tow vehicle. And just like Jake said, I primarily would drive around with in, in our uh, tow vehicle and got really comfortable from working from the crew cab in the back, uh, which is nice because like the center console is the exact width of the computer, really easy to work from. And if I don't have a connection, I can drive around, turn the booster on and really find where that connection is at that time. Yeah. Awesome. No, and, and, and sorry, Chris, just one thing. I mean, the, the sure. antenna, I mean, I'm not sure if you mentioned this or not, but obviously Airstreams are extremely um, Sturdy. I mean, it's a it's a metal container, right? I mean, it's an aluminum container. Signal doesn't get in there very well, so an antenna is going to be huge. If you're sitting in your airstream and it's and it's raining out and you don't have an antenna, you're kind of SOL because you don't you're not going to be able to if the cell signal per, you know, permeating through that metal that shell is is not going to be as good as if you have an antenna on top. So antennas are and we found pretty important, um, especially if you're going to be working inside for if it's cold or raining or something like that. Yeah, and especially too, if, if you think about, you know, some of the most beautiful places to camp are, um, for some folks are, are you know, out in forests and, and national parks, and usually those are on the fringes sometimes of, of cellular coverage areas. So the antenna is a big advantage there. David has a question though that came in. Um, in terms of routing the antenna externally, um, you know, I know I'll, I'll give two examples. I don't know if you guys have additional ones on top of this, but uh, you know, one way is to get an actual gland on the top of the, the roof, actually go through the ceiling uh, and run it through the interior skin and, and then go up and out. Um, so that, that's one way. I've seen some 
folks, uh, you know, actually go through the refrigerator vent uh, because that's already a channel to get up to the roof on some models. There's the, there's the vent on the roof for the refrigerator to do that. So those are those are two ways. Have you guys found any other? Don't use the uh, don't use the stove vent. Don't use the stove vent. That's a good. One. <laughs> Heat is not good. Yeah. All right. Yeah, ours is right, through right. the uh, twelve volt twelve volt fan. So right right here. So our antenna is wired right through that. And then for the, the tow vehicle, uh, you actually just, it, it, you can just shut the door on the wire. You just sort of put it in yeah. um, the side of the door. Awesome, good, uh, good advice. So let's take another, uh, or actually one more point on this one. So uh, this solution is really uh, great for folks who are either just getting started with cellular-based mobile internet uh, and a way to kind of try it out, right? This is, if you don't want to make a huge investment out of the gate, this is a great way to, to test it. This next one uh, gets you closer to what we all have as Wi-Fi in our, in our traditional houses, right? You have a router that's, uh, that's inside the vehicle creating its own always on Wi-Fi network. And then you have a central antenna usually mounted on the roof of the vehicle. Um, the, you know, the pros to this, this particular approach is it's, it's kind of minimal equipment. Uh, you have the router, you have a wire that goes from the router to the antenna, and then you have a power source. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, you have the ability to support more advanced configurations in this in this type of setup. Uh, and most of these that are built for mobile use uh, and the ones that are used for Airstream Connected and built into the classic on the Airstream Smart Side are, are all 12 volt, which is nice. So if you're, if you're off-grid camping, you don't have to worry about running the inverter to run the internet. Uh, and as I said, it's it's close to having an always on Wi-Fi network that we have at our house. So, you know, a lot of we hear a lot from folks who are, you know, will have a camera inside the vehicle because they have a pet that they're leaving in while they're going out hiking. This enables them the ability to kind of keep an eye on things while they're away from their airstream. And, and on the, the trade off. Side of, oh, sorry, go ahead, uh, go ahead, Jake. I'll say, I mean, the counter of that, it's great when you if you're boondocking, you're not hooked up to power, but just if you're not using it. For any reason, I would take it out because you want to try to conserve power battery as much as you can. I know we talked about that. Um, yeah, that's a good, that's a good point. It, it is consuming power. Um, yeah, that's right. So if you're not, not going to be using it, definitely turn it off just like you would uh, a light or any appliance. The trade-off or, or kind of con to this type of setup is, you know, it's, it's more expensive. This is, uh, this is definitely an investment. Um, and, you know, some of these uh, can be difficult to upgrade over time. I know that the approach that Airstream has taken with 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 enabling connectivity in their vehicles is everything is is for the most part pretty modular. We'll talk a little bit about pre-wire and and some antenna installations that already come today as standard in Airstreams. But the way that they've approached it is as the router, uh, if you have or are considering purchasing Airstream Connected, for example, that router is, is modular. So as a new one comes out, you can plug a new one in that's faster over time. So an easy upgrade path there. Um, but this is really recommended for people uh, who have a really good idea of their mobile internet needs. Uh, investment in the antenna, investment in the router, um, but this is a kind of a you know, fully integrated solution. Uh, I'm just gonna take, take a quick look at some of the questions that have come in here. Um, let's see. All right, some folks saying Airstream is a Faraday cage. Not quite, but, but, but close. I mean, we have you know, big, big windows and things like that to let the signal in, um, but the aluminum definitely will impact uh, the ability for signal to get in. Um, let's take another look here at a, at a different approach. This one is about uh, satellite. So I think I have a picture coming up in a couple of slides, or it's actually a, a small one here at the top um, of a satellite system that I put on top of the tow vehicle. Again, satellite, in order for it to work, it has, needs to have a clear view of the sky. Uh, so I wanted the ability to basically separate, park my Airstream underneath the tree somewhere, and then park the tow vehicle out uh, to get that clear shot. So, you know, the pros to this one is really internet almost anywhere. Um, you know, a lot of excitement in the space when you start to follow some of the news around Starlink and other folks who are uh, you know, investing in this space. Um, the cons here, it's you know, large equipment. That dish on top of the, the tow vehicle there is pretty beefy. Um, high latency. So this really means like how long does it take 
uh, for my request for my computer to actually make it to the other end. Uh, so just kind of slower in general in terms of uh, how the internet works and how your connection will work. Uh, longer term contracts, generally you can't do month to month or some of the more flexible options that you see in the cellular space. And you'll also be you know, capped in terms of uh, not only how much data can you use, but how much speed is there. So it's not uncommon for a satellite provider to, to say, you're only gonna get three meg throughput and, and that's it. Um, you know, these are really recommended for those who, who want to head out anywhere and not have to worry about connectivity. Uh, you know, one of the reasons I, I made the investment here is that I saw that some of the most awesome places to camp were places that didn't have any cell phone coverage. And also, by the way, didn't have any people because there were, <laughs> people couldn't stay there. And so I'd have, you know, just really great experience being able to stay a week and work and stay connected without having to worry about uh, if I could get a connection to the internet or not. Hey, Chris, how much power did, did that take? Especially if you're off the grid, how much did it did it suck up a lot of power having the- It was, yeah, it's a great question. It was definitely, uh, you know, power hungry. Um, you know, when you look at once it actually would uh, move itself around and lock onto a satellite, uh, it was probably close to 100, 100 watts of power, 80 watts of power, something like that. Wow. Yeah. Um, this next one uh, is on cellular boosters. So again, all these images are from the Mobile Internet Resource Center. Just wanna make sure that they're getting credit for the, the good work that they've done here. Um, three components really to this system when you think about what a cellular booster enables. Uh, this first one is the external antenna. So on this slide, this is the little red antenna that's on the roof. This is also called the donor antenna. Um, you know, sometimes you can also place this in a window uh, theoretically, it should be more capable and better positioned than the antennas built into your phone uh, or mobile hotspot. So less constrained here from a size standpoint, if you were to look at you know, the, the phone that's on your desk right now, uh, limited form factor in terms of how big you can make the antenna in there versus you get into the world of cellular boosters uh, and you can really you know, make things a lot bigger. The second piece is an amplifier. So this is the part uh, that many you know, booster designs that will receive the, the signal, they'll also use it to transmit it back out, uh, but it contains all the electronics that amplify the signal and then retransmit it. It's really the kind of the brains and heart of the setup. And then the last kind of piece to this solution is the interior antenna. So most boost boosters work by broadcasting the amplified signal wirelessly into an indoor antenna allowing whatever devices are within range to have improved signal for voice and cellular data. So I have a big, big megaphone uh, picture it on, on top of your Airstream, trying to listen and grab that signal that's there and then uh, amplifying it inside the vehicle. Two things that I've learned with, uh, with using this, the better vertical separation you can get between the two antennas, the better. Um, so, vertical distance between the external antenna and the internal antenna, uh, the more you can you know, increase that distance, the more that the amplifier can work to try to rebroadcast that signal. If they're too close together, they'll start to feed back to itself and the booster will actually shut itself down or try to you know, minimize its um, uh, amplification. The second piece here is if there's absolutely no cell phone coverage here to begin with, a booster is not going to help. It's not going to magically create some cell phone signal. You need at least a little bit um, to get uh, to have to, for this to be effective. Justin, Jake, any ads to this based on your experience? Justin, I know you have a lot of lot of field booster experience. I'll I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, I, I think I, I said a little bit earlier. Like I, I have it for the insurance. It doesn't it doesn't always work. I think the big thing with cellular boosters is don't expect to get into somewhere where there's uh, a lot of people and uh, see that there's a connection and think that it's going to get boosted again, because it really works when a tower is not being accessed as much. So if you're more remote, it has more of a chance of being able to boost that connection. Uh, I've actually found that sometimes when I maybe had one bar or it was on 3G that it would boost it up to two bars, um, it would make it so that it would be able to work uh, and again, had it for insurance, didn't have it because I expected it to work everywhere. Um, but if you're going to be traveling quite a bit and working full time, having that insurance is is vital. Yeah. I mean, we we actually don't even have a cell booster. We never used it. I mean, 
whenever Jess needed, I mean, you can speak to her, but whenever we needed good service, we just drove to find it. Uh, or we did some recon before, you know, when sun, sunsets happen and it's kind of dusk, you'd go out and you'd park and then kind of drive around and find service to where you can go the next day. Yeah. J Justin, or, or maybe open question to the panel here. In this space, there are obviously lots of folks who make make boosters. I know uh, you'll provide some, ex you know, what you've used. I just want to call it to folks. We don't, there are no commercial relationships here. This is not a, you know, affiliate marketing or anything uh, of that. But what have you guys used in the field when it comes to cell boosters? Yeah, well, I use, uh, or we use WeBoost. Uh, WeBoost has a um, they have many different types of boosters. You could have one even on like, you could put one on a house, you could put one on a trailer, you could put one on your tow vehicle. We don't have one on our house, but we do have one on our uh, tow vehicle and we have one on our trailer. Um, I would actually recommend uh, getting an upgraded uh, external antenna. Uh, the antenna it comes with is okay, but if you get an external antenna, again, it's gonna be able to help you make sure that you uh, uh, can get a better connection. And if you're, I think it might be around like $50, like. If, uh, if you're traveling, what's that $50 gonna be if you can have one more bar of service? So that, mm -hmm. that's the thing to keep in mind is you don't wanna overbuy before a trip, but at the same time, you wanna make sure you have things and not be wishing, man, I really wish I had bought that antenna right now. So um, yeah, we use WeBoost. Awesome. Here's a, here's a slide, uh, a helpful decision tree, right? So folks who are probably listening to this saying, oh, should I, should I get a booster? This is really helpful just to understand if a booster would help you. I'm just gonna walk through the, the yellow dots here. Um, you know, either take a screenshot of this or yeah, check out the recording when it's available next week. But you know, the first one is, do you have poor cellular performance to begin with? You know, yes or no, and that'll give you a different uh, kind of recommendation. Uh, do you depend on your phones for data? So this is specifically in the, in the use case of uh, what Justin is actually doing right now. He's inside, inside his Airstream, he's using his phone as a hotspot. In that situation, if you're you know, experiencing some marginal cell phone signal, Booster would probably help. Um, and then the other one uh, here on the right is, is upload speed important. So uh, just a helpful tool to understand uh, you know, if a booster is, is right for you. This next uh, slide I think is, is really helpful because uh, you know, we would get questions uh, and the technical support team at Airstream would get questions really around speed. Um, you know, they would do a, you know, some, some owners would do a speed test with their phone and then a speed test with Airstream connected and, and there, there was a difference. And so this chart really um, helps to uh, educate what the differences are when it comes to different uh, modems. So every uh, mobile router, every cellular phone has a modem inside of it, a cellular modem inside of it to enable its connection to the network. And each modem is rated at a different speed. So if you look on the left here, we'll just kind of quickly go down this LTE, you know, you have category three, which starts at hundred megabytes per second down and 50 up, which is quite, quite a lot of, of data, uh, which you'll see here in a couple slides on how much data do you really need. Um, you know, all the way up to, to category 20, which is, you know, gets into the world of, of, of gigabytes per second down. So just two benchmarks here um, to help bring this to life a little bit so that the, um, the modem that's part of Airstream connected and the Smart Classic is, a, is made, you know, by, by Pepwave, it's a BR1 mini, um, and it actually has a CAT6 modem inside of it. Uh, so when you look at the theoretical speeds of that, that's 300 down, 50 up, so lots of Lots of potential there. Um, and then just for comparison, uh, an iPhone 8, 8 Plus, or even an iPhone X is a Cat 12. So, so big difference when you start to look at, at, at speed. Um, as you go faster in speed, uh, the devices just get expensive, more expensive really quickly. So um, you know, one of the key differences between uh, when, when Airstream looked at how could they enable connectivity in the vehicle? Um, it was really around how can we create a reliable connection to the internet? Uh, maybe not CAT 12 or CAT 20, but how can we use an external antenna, larger form factor for better performance uh, and still enable uh, a, a good connection to the internet? So just a little background on, on some of the speed differences that folks might experience if they're doing speed tests on their phone or speed tests on different 
different devices. Usually you can find the speed, uh, the category just by Googling, uh, you know, whatever the device is and then cat LTE speed and that'll, that'll shed some light on it. Um, quick illustration here, uh, you know, some questions coming in about how do we run wires? How do we uh, get uh, access to the antenna on the roof? I just wanted to do a quick overview on uh, what exists today. Um, so all Airstream travel trailers uh, from base camp all the way up to Globe Trotter have uh, what we call pre-wire. So the hardest work uh, in installing this is actually having access to the ceiling, getting the wires out to the roof. So Airstream took the approach and said, hey, actually let's do that during the manufacturing process. Let's run the necessary cables so an owner can connect the router uh, and then you know connect the antenna with the you know, help of their local dealer um, to, to enable connectivity. So we, we, we hope that this makes uh, enabling activity a lot easier inside of Airstream travel trailers. And then of course on the classic, because of the technology that's built into that vehicle, it's already integrated uh, as part of the solution. For folks who have a touring coach, uh, Atlas or an interstate, um, builds on top of what we've done for a travel trailer in terms of the pre-wire, we've just added the antenna on top. So in this environment, you really just need to bring, bring a router uh, to the equation to enable connectivity. Hey, and, and Chris, on that too, I mean, you know, 2011, at least ours did not come pre-wired because I think this was before this was even possible, uh, you know, back in 2011. So it was pretty easy. We just took it in to get service. I mean, it, it took maybe three hours from start to finish to get the it wired uh, router, everything said they, they helped us set it up and everything. So um, if, if it doesn't come pre-wired, it's not like that's a, you're all of a sudden out. You just, it's, it's pretty simple to be able to have someone do it. Awesome. That's a good, good background for folks. Some questions actually coming in exactly on this topic um, on, on the pre-wire piece. I'm gonna chat with Adam here, who I know is, is on the line just to see when we started. I know that anything that's this model year forward has it, but I'll just confirm with Adam on uh, on how far back that started. So, uh, you know, I, I think for as as consumers, we're all exposed to uh, you know speed and five G and all of these things that the carriers are always uh, kind of pushing out in terms of how how great their network is. Um, so it's easy to think that you need a ton of bandwidth in order to get the job done, and um, we've actually. Uh, you'd be surprised on how little you need. So this next slide, uh, we just really took the use case of you know, you know, folks who are, might be doing you know, learning remotely with their family, or even working from the road. Here are two stats, two sets of stats um, for Zoom and Microsoft Teams. So Zoom, if you're video conferencing, uh, single screen, two megabytes per second up and down. So really not a lot uh, when you think about it. Uh, especially when some home internet connections are, you know, 50 megabytes per second, or even in the realm of fiber with with uh, with gigs. If you're just going to do a screen share with some audio, 100 to 350 kilobytes per second, and just audio only, like a phone call, 60 to 80. So not a huge bandwidth requirement when it comes to uh, staying connected, at least on Zoom. Microsoft similar stats here, a little bit more lightweight when it comes to how much data uh, is is needed, but you know almost you know, 1.5 megabits up and down and then 130 kilobytes for screen share and then only 30 for audio audio via audio VoIP. So not a ton at all. Um, this of course leads to the question of like, well, how much data would I use in an actual month? <laughs> um, which is a, a great question when you're trying to understand what cell phone should I buy, all, all of that. Um, here's an app that I've, I've used, not only for understanding how much data I use, but also to help prioritize some of the network traffic that goes out. Um, this one is, is, is just for Mac. Um, there might be a PC equivalent uh, out there, I think also for this from this company. But the idea is you can use this software in two different modes. It's called trip mode. And you install it and you can just basically have it monitor how much, how much uh, traffic you're using or how much data you're using by application. So you can just leave it on and you know, maybe do a test for a week or a month just to get that benchmark. Um, but more importantly, if you're in that environment where you only have, let's say five or six megabytes 
uh, per second up and down. Um, you don't necessarily need to, you don't wanna run everything uh, out of your computer like you normally would. Your, your photos maybe don't need to be syncing in the background. Maybe you don't have the software automatic update running in the background. You just wanna focus on Zoom or email or Microsoft Teams or whatever the application is. You can actually, you can see here on the left, you can actually select what applications you want to have access to the internet. So in those constrained environments where you might not have a really you know, high amount of throughput, this is a great way to prioritize the traffic so you're not, not fighting. Justin, I know that you are, you know, the whole panel here, how much data would you find yourselves using uh, in the average, average month? I think it's really going to depend on how much, uh, what, what am I doing for work? If it's, if I'm not having to upload a lot of stuff, which um, generally with work, I might have uh, one or two big uploads. So for work, I'll uh, uh, create content and then I'll upload it to Dropbox. And that's when it really sucks a, a lot of data usage. So I try and I try and do that in times where maybe I'm connected with Wi-Fi. If I can't, I know that I'm probably going to take, uh, take a hit on it. Uh, I, I know if I have 60, if I have 60 gigs of, of, of uh, data, like high speed, I feel like I'll be able to work uh, more confidently. And I think it really helps to understand other things you can do. For instance, I'm using my hotspot to dial into this call, but I'm using the audio in my, uh, or I called in and I'm not using voice. So that, that's like a big pro tip for everyone is, is if you have the ability, like I don't think you can do it with Google Hangout, but if you're on a Zoom call, don't use the, uh, don't connect. Uh, with your with your hotspot connection, call in because even right now, if my hotspot was uh, deprioritized, meaning like I wasn't having high speed and I was my video was skipping, my audio is not going to skip. And I think that's one of the biggest issues I see with most remote workers who are doing this is they get really worried about skipping on a call where maybe your video is skipping, but if you call in, you have a better chance and you're saving bandwidth. Um, so looking for opportunities like that. Yeah. I mean, as far as us, I mean, I don't know exactly how much we were using because we tried to group it together where we could do all of our, you know, just as a creator so she can do a lot of offline work and we can go and sync it up here at a later time. Awesome. Great, great real world experience. Some questions coming in here. A lot of, a lot of questions around when did pre-wire start? So I uh, did, did confirm with the folks back in Jackson Center that uh, all models uh, got it this past summer. So anything model year 2021 or later or newer, uh, we'll have that pre-wire if it's, if it's in the travel trailer line or that pre-wire plus antenna if it's on the touring coach line. Uh, a couple other questions here in terms of different carriers to use in Airstream Connected. Um, yes, without a doubt. So that the Peplink router that's enabling that connection is, is unlocked. So uh, I know that there early on there were some some unlimited data plans from AT and T that got end of life. Um, so if folks have you know different opportunities uh, with different carriers, uh, absolutely no problem to to put a new uh, a new SIM there. You might just have to coordinate with the technical su support folks back in Ohio to get access to change the APN if it doesn't pull it all together. So just some deep technical stuff, but the modem is unlocked. You can put any any carrier in there. Um, so let's talk about planning. I think, you know, a lot of this, uh, removing some of the variables before you actually get to the campground, um, sets you up to have a productive, you know, stress-free experience if you're relying on connectivity. Um, you know, a lot of people will use um, Campendium as a resource. They do a great job with user-generated content um, on a whole host of different review characteristics to cleanliness and noise and all, all, all this at a, at a campsite. But they, a, a few years ago, they started including uh, cell phone reviews by carrier. So you'll see a screenshot here uh, of Mountain View campground uh, and different users reporting what their real world experience is. So super helpful when it comes to uh, trying to understand, will I be connected or will I have the ability to stay connected uh, from there? Jake, I think you had a tip on this screen too, in terms of uh, you know how to access this, this data. Yeah, so I mean, I would definitely use the app and, their, and they have a website, just give compendium.com. Um, it's gonna be you know equal parts, um, um, it's gonna be the same information, but I found sometimes uh, that the actual uh, um, once some one time or the other, 
won't allow you to view something because you have to sign in or something like that. So definitely sign in, make you make a user profile um, so you can comment everywhere you've been and help other people out. Um, but make sure you know about the website too because um, uh, it's good it's good to have both options in, in different scenarios. Yeah, we'll use like the map function on there too um, to see like where we're going and if there's any pin drops of campgrounds there. You can always um, count on people at Camp Pendian to keep it real with you if you're either going to be parked by like a beautiful river or, you know, a dumpster, they'll, they'll tell you. Um, and, you know, we just tried to, uh, going like off of planning for connectivity, I mean, if you have the um, luxury or the opportunity to kind of uh, determine when you work, something that I think we picked up a little bit late on our trip that ended up doing really well for us is like having work weeks, you know, where we can control our own schedule. So for like one week, we know we're going to be parked somewhere with like a good cell tower. We'll check Campendium, make sure it's strong service, batch all of our Zoom calls, you know, everything that we know will require bandwidth and then um, then go off the grid the next week and do all the fun things that you can do in an Airstream and not worry about having to be back by three and making sure you have service. So Campendium um, really helped us kind of map out and plan for when we're going to be on and when we're going to be off because that's part of the fun of living in an Airstream is also to be unconnected. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. The, the ability to choose, I think, is, uh, is what, yeah. what, makes it, what makes it work. Um, another tool, uh, and, and this is actually usually maybe out of order a little bit, but the, the first thing that I'll, I'll tend to look at is uh, this coverage app, uh, which happens to be by the same folks who have the mobile internet resource center. Um, but, but this app is, it's really handy in the sense that you can overlay different carriers and just, just get a general sense of like, is there e even coverage there to begin with? Um, and then you can hop into, you know, looking at, at Campendium. So it's a great starting point. Uh, you know, Jake, I know that when we talked the other day, it's not street by street. You know, it's not going to maybe take into account the big blockage or oak tree that's in front. Yeah. It's more kind of a higher level overview of, uh, you know, what's available before you kind of dig more into the details. Definitely. I mean, if, if you're going somewhere um, and, and, you, and you're looking at it and it's, there's no coverage anywhere around you, you can't even see it on your screen, you're not going to have it. If it's on the edge, there's a 90% chance. And you, it also means you could drive two minutes or maybe just get to a higher location and get service. But um, it's like you said, it's not street by street, but it does a really good job of giving you general, you know, hey, is there a chance I'm going to have uh, a connection here? And obviously, the more in a, in a city you are, the higher likelihood of that. Awesome. A um, couple of questions coming in, just uh, some follow ups from the pre wire. So that was model year 2021 or newer. Uh, and then working with your local dealership, um, you know, can get can get the rest of the pieces to make that work. So any travel trailer model 2021 or newer uh, has the pre-wire uh, to make that installation a bit easier. And then on the soaring coach side, it has the pre-wire and the antenna. Um, one other question here, just what type of antenna is used in, as part of that kit? It's a it's a pointing uh, P Y O N T I N G uh, antenna that that's used as part of that kit. Um, Airstream has done some work to make a special mounting bracket and the gland to make a waterproof seal uh, so it works well on an Airstream roof. But inside that antenna is your uh, GPS uh, and then also the cellular and Wi-Fi antenna. So it's kind of an all-in-one uh, unit on the roof there. So for folks who are looking to, you know, really relying on connectivity to enable their experience in the outdoors or check in on loved ones, whatever the use case is, um, I have found that the people who answer the phone at the Park Service or the National Forest or the Bureau of Land Management, you know, Ranger District, the folks who are the custodians of whatever public land you want to go camping on, uh, are generally some of the nicest folks I've ever, you know, ever, ever talked to. So if I've done my check on coverage and it looks like there's going to be some good coverage there, good cellular coverage there, if I've read some reviews uh, on Campendium or other places to really understand if there's good coverage there, um, and if it's maybe marginal or I'm just kind of questioning it, I'll, I'll call, um, I'll figure out what district the campsite's in. I'll look up the number online and I'll call. And, you know, if it's not the person who answers the phone, 
it'll get handed off to the person who does road maintenance in that district who drives that whole district all the time and you'll say hey um, i'm planning to camp up here what's the cell phone coverage like is there verizon is there at&t and just the boots on the ground knowledge has been incredibly helpful just to remove some of those variables out of the equation the, and with boots mm -hmm. on the ground, that should also that should also be you. So whenever you go to a spot, even if somebody tells you something's going to work, do a dry run. Don't wait until the day of and, and experience that stress or pressure. Always always experiment with it, even different times of day. Uh, I think it's helpful, but just wanted to say boots on the ground should also be you when you're getting there. Yeah, and it's a, and that's a Justin. That's a perfect segue into kind of when to make those moves. Um, when I'm full time working from the road. I'm always looking to make moves on the weekend. Um, I you know, generally keep kind of Monday through Friday, nine to five hours with the work that I do. Um, so the weekend enables me to pick up and move. I'll, I'll try to do my moves on a Saturday in case I get to the spot and it's either not what I thought it was or there wasn't connectivity. I have one more day before Monday comes around. The disadvantage to this approach is this is usually when all the weekend warriors are out. Uh, you know, the ability to find that great spot is it maybe as good as it would be if, if it was on like, I don't know, a Wednesday morning? So uh, I know that you know each of you uh, has a different approach to this. Jake and Jess, I'll hear your, your approach because you have a little bit of flexibility in your schedule. Yeah, we usually like to travel in the middle of the week. Um, there's just less people on the road. And just like you were saying, Chris, if we're going to a campground that's first come first serve, like you don't want to get there on a Friday evening or a Saturday morning. Or you'll be leaving right away. Yeah, um, it can get pretty aggressive. So uh, traveling during the week um, is, is usually before sundown, just to make sure you get there and you can set up when it's still light out. And Justin, what about you? Yeah, so we, we traveled quite a bit pretty quickly. We only stayed in a spot for about three, uh, three days, three to five days at a time. Five was maybe on the long end. Uh, and sometimes we'd just be traveling through an area overnight. So we did a lot of boondocking um, and we would prioritize boondocking where, or actually you can find out with a lot of places that you're driving to, what sort of big parking lots are going to be along the way. Uh, and we found that again, like whether it's Planet Fitness, whether it's a Walmart, Home Depot, when you can find places where there's bigger shopping centers, we could find places where we would be able to have the ability to connect more. There wasn't like, a, uh, we sort of just made it work. If a place didn't have something, we would move on um, again, just because we were traveling so quickly. So it is possible if you want to travel fast um, and you're open to be able to working from a parking lot for a day and then going somewhere that night and then maybe doing that the next day again, like that, that was our approach. Great, 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 uh, great things. And I think one thing, once you get there, important to test and try to, again, uh, remove as many variables as possible. Two apps that I use all the time for this. One is just the speed test app that's available for both iOS and Android. They also make a, a, a desktop version for uh, the computer in addition to just you know using, using the website. Uh, but this will give you the uh, up and down so thinking back to that previous example on how much up and down do you need for a Zoom call or for a Microsoft Teams call, this will give you an early indication on, okay, is this spot gonna, going to be okay to support what I want to do? Um, so that's the screenshot on the left. The screenshot on the right uh, is, you know, Zoom has this, I didn't find one for Microsoft, but Zoom has this, the ability to uh, go and, and basically join a test meeting. You can test your video, you can test your audio, uh, you can you know, give that a shot before you actually need it. Um, I wanna you know, pop over to the next slide here, uh, just to pull together some of the, the, the tips from this group kind of collectively with, you, with our experience of the road. Justin, I'll start with you for the first two. Yeah, I, I think because I work for my uh, tow vehicle quite a bit, I learned to get a, a portable battery solution with, with, uh, with solar to charge it. And uh, the first trip, we were pretty unsuccessful with it. We were testing all these different batteries and I have found that uh, just for the purposes of today's call, I've been powering everything with, I use this EcoFlow River battery. Uh, I've, I've been charging this computer, which you don't always have to continuously charge it, but it's only been about 8% uh, uh, power that I've used with keeping the, all, all of these devices charged for the past two hours. So I think having a portable battery solution, EcoFlow has a, a built-in 
charge controller. So you can you can plug it into the wall, you can charge it, you can charge it with just a solar panel. Um, so I think that's a really big one, especially if you want to make sure that your devices are powered, no matter if you're in your unit or if you're in your tow vehicle. And then uh, another tip is, it's not just thinking that you should be working on your uh, on your desktop computer uh, with a hotspot. Like if you have, uh, you can work on, I work on my smartphone quite a bit. I'll use like Slack and I'll be talking with people on my smartphone. Um, I can even work in like Google Drive, but a tablet can be great because a tablet, um, if you add uh, a plan to it, you can get a tablet that has its own uh, keyboard and you're not actually using, if it's on an unlimited plan, you're not actually using that 30 gigabytes of data if it's like through Verizon, because that's where the, they, the, the speed that they'll give you unlimited. Um, but I think being able to do something on a tablet and then you'll actually be able to work a lot longer so it can get around some of those bandwidth issues. Good, that's good advice there. J Jake and Jess, how about you guys? Yeah, um, working outside or just one of the things that we loved about Airstream models was the windows. Um, we found a lot of other ones seemed closed in where what's the point of doing this if you don't have, you know, a beautiful view outside. And for me, you know, I'm a, an author for my job. And so I need to constantly kind of be inspired and having a different like window each day uh, was really great for just all around morale and creativity when you're working from home. And Jake even put together a little standing desk for me um, inside so I can literally just work out the window and, and, and look, but uh, it's really fun to, to work and see like a moose walk by. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> we have a picture of it. I think Airstream reposted it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It was wild. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then the other thing is, you know, just kind of touched on this a little bit, but just if you're not blocking off weeks, definitely block off days or just try to schedule everything together where, you know, like just said, we have, we're fortunate that we can kind of control our own schedule. I know some people are, are in that situation. Um, but if you can just try to group all of your zoom meetings, early in the morning or group them all together. Don't have them all spread out because it takes just as long to set up um, and get everything for con connection if it's a 30 minute meeting versus if it's an eight hour work day. Um, so just try to be as efficient as possible with your time so that you maybe you work through lunch so you can be done at three in the summer and then go on a hike uh, you know, for sunset or um, you know, maybe grouping everything up um, in the morning. Remember we were in uh, Glacier National Park and everything was, once 8 a.m. hit, you had no cell phone service anywhere. And so we would wake up at five or six and work for three or four hours and get everything done and then go enjoy the day. Um, maybe that means working on a Saturday and Sunday so that Monday and Tuesday, when there's less people, you can you can go and um, you can go and enjoy the park with you know a little bit less crowds or you know doing whatever you want to do. So um, yeah, two good, pretty important things. Good, yeah, good, good advice there. My my quick two here. Uh, enable Wi-Fi calling. I think uh, most of the carriers today give you the ability to turn this on. Uh, turn it on before you need it. This really enables you to make uh, phone calls when you don't have any cellular connection on your phone, but are connected to a Wi-Fi network that does have a connection to the internet. Uh, and then one of the uh, iOS updates recently uh, enabled low data mode. So again, controlling the stuff that gets pushed out, if you enable low data mode, it uh, you know, stops the syncing of your photo library and things like that if you're on a, on a smaller connection to help make sure you have a good experience. I'm gonna to try to place through these uh, remaining couple of slides here. Um, a lot of the content that we used previously uh, with different types of sample setups and things like that came from Mobile Internet Resource Center. They're kind enough to extend uh, for folks who are joining this webinar. They have a ton of free content. Um, they also have a premium membership that's, uh, that's I think pretty affordable. Um, so take, take a look at this. The free content is, is awesome. There are lots of questions that came in too around, hey, the Airstream connected plans with AT&T, uh, are there other options? So again, the device is unlocked. The part of the free content from, from these folks uh, here who we don't have a commercial relationship with um, are doing plan reviews. So they'll actually track every single cell phone plan that's in the market uh, and give you feedback and recommendations on it. So folks who are serious about staying connected on the road, definitely check, check these guys out. Um, check these guys out here. Um, and then our Q and A section, I think we have maybe one uh, time for one question just because we're, we're running out of time here. Um, maybe just uh, Justin and Jake, some questions around cell phone boosters. 
can you give us the, the, the brand that, uh, Justin, that you're using? I'll kick it over to you to Jake and that'll be our last question. Yep, I use uh, WeBoost. I use it in uh, a tow vehicle and in our Airstream. Awesome. And what about you guys, Jake and Dust? Uh, we don't use a booster. Um, we okay. just, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we uh, tend like to, to live life on the edge. Yeah. We, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> our motto on the trip was figure it out. And sometimes that, you know, bit us in the butt, but, uh, you know, it, it, it worked out. Awesome. Well, I want to thank uh, Jake, Jess, and Justin so much for your time today. Here's a promo code for Airstream Supply Company that we mentioned at the beginning. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have. If we didn't have a chance to answer a question, and I know that there are quite a few uh, in the chat, please do send us an email, hello at airstream.com. Uh, that's H-E-L-L-O at airstream.com. Uh, and we'll get right back to you uh, if we didn't have a chance today. So thanks again for spending part of your day with us. Please take a moment to give us your feedback, uh, including future topics you'd like to see on Ask an Airstreamer on the next screen. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks, guys.